Hi, I think we're just about ready to get started. Hello. Um, we're so happy to be here tonight. Lily Poetry Review is grateful to James Frazier and to all of the people mm -hmm. here at Rollier uh, for this opportunity to read. And I personally am so mm -hmm. proud to present these three fantastic poets, all of whom, if there are editors in the audience, are magical to work with. Um, the, I'll oh introduce God. each one as they come up and then just introduce the next and the next. Um, so again, Lily Poetry Review mm -hmm. Books authors. Um, the first person Looking is an artist, on. a poet, an animator, a designer. Genius sees what we cannot see and the artist creates it. In this case, Martha McCullough is both. I am so pleased to celebrate this remarkable poet and hear her read her work tonight. Martha has an MFA in painting from Pratt Institute. Her poems have appeared in Bear Review, Radar, Zone 3, Tampa Review, Salamander, among many others. Not only is she an exquisite book designer for Lily, but her chapbook, Grandmother Mountain, was published by Blue Lyra Press. Wolf Hat Iron Shoes is her first full-length poetry collection, and for all of our betterment, we do well to watch for future collections. Stephen Riel writes, in Martha McCullough's Wolf Hat, I and Shoes, we witness a deeply observant and questioning mind guide a bright pointer across the planetarium of our current and pending disasters. From dystopia and pandemic to colliding galaxies, What's most affecting is the bravely undefended lyricism this poet deploys to scout an era in which all the hum, home come chickens weigh the branches into downward arcs. Please welcome Martha McCullough. Thank you, Eileen. And thank you all for coming. I'm so happy to see you here today. Um, I'm going to read partly from my book and partly uh, from some new work. And once I put these on, I won't be able to see your faces anymore. <laughs> Sorry. History. Last box of black apples. Time to know a small number of things very well. Half fox in a fable, half handyman. I am prepared to be bored, though I'm told it's a spiritual crime. You get used to a limited winter diet, rutabagas and television. Contrary to expectations, things continue to happen. Tornado, wildfire, wars chipping away, angel blown backward in the storm. I want an apple read all the way through, an apple that understands sin. I go into the orchard on a frozen morning, pick an empty ice apple, smell of grass rising in the thaw, the wreckage piling up, sharp bits falling off, clinking all the way from Eden. Half light, a live owl looking at me through green twigs. Another thought behind my thought clings to our shared three seconds of now, thought and thought of, flick and jitter, pursuing what flees to the desert of next. Call it life of the mind, more useless than my cat. Back and forth, rabbit, duck, rabbit, what has been, what is now given, name still in the book, the creature gone. And speaking of creatures, this is Pajama Cat Shark. <laughs> One of the minor sharks, small, harmless, how it responds to threat, 
curls in circle, hiding eyes with tail. La la la, pajama cat shark can't see you. <laughs> Sinking down and down into blue silence. Called cat for its slit pupiled eyes. Pajama for the stripes in which it lies motionless all day, like a depressed writer in its weedy bed. <laughs> Psyche, flattering, a bad steal away, my iron shoe cracks the walk. Discarded half coin, lamps batter, whose perverse spell is this? Night hovers, no spangled coloratura, but cold indigo. Monopoly moon, fugitive apparition, shine down on us discontinued tokens thimble or tin dog, never to pass go, ride the railroad, own a street. The iron staff rusted to filigree, inside the cloud, a rush of feathers. Mm -hmm. Tree shadows, cross the road like cracks in the reel. Lying on cold grass, we look at the stars, wait for the galaxy's dim cross-section to fade in behind bright constellations. Our eyes follow faint light into a giddy sense of falling up into the sky. In a night full of noise, small rackety things shrill on the edges of this field, not thinking of time. <clears throat> or orphan light. It's two short prose poems. This is called Then. You can tell it's the past because I'm lighting a cigarette off a cigarette. Yeah. And no one is building condos in the fields along the harbor because there are only tall grass, a broken shopping cart, a hawk hopping after mice. What I miss about the past, smoking and uselessness. <laughs> angel. The witness angel in the oak watches a crow row through milk mild air, hears pigs below rooting for acorns, sees vetch leap a ditch in slow motion. All day long, the wild bees forage. At dusk, the cautious deer step out of the thicket. not working. Work is our punishment. And because I am not sorry, I mean to do as little as possible. <laughs> I adrift like Radon's ominous balloon, looking at nothing or the wall with great intensity. I want to see what the cat sees, insect ghosts, jitter of molecules, between dust motes into some elsewhere, there might be heaven, though no one here cares to find out. I think I'll read Jerome in the Wilderness. I have a problem with the church I grew up in and its horrible patriarchs. Anyway, Jerome in the Wilderness. In a God's eye view, all the edges are sharp, tiny but distinct. Jerome picnics on a ledge with his apocryphal lion, sunlight falling on him in particular. Does he wonder if God might prefer him unwashed in stained starving rags as he has recommended to the Roman matrons, some now presumably in heaven? But no, he's wearing rose silk. He's brought along his tall crucifix, a skull, the egg-shaped stones he likes, the elegant apparatus of his project. His hat's a red bright circle on the grass. Behind him, from a stony spindle, green hills tumble to the horizon. There is so much to see, the light that burnishes the sawtooth edge of every leaf, small castles punctuating the wilderness, and in a corner, 
awkward camels crossing a narrow bridge. The lion dozes. Jerome, kneeling half out of his robe, holds up a stone, ready to hit himself and to go on hitting hard until God pays attention. Mm -hmm. A bad end. The bad things you've done pursue you in the form of a fabulous beast whose mouth is the entrance to hell. Crashing through wood and thicket, you reach and cling to the door of your house, gasping as though it could save you from something dense as the earth's core, thing for which walls hardly exist. And then this will be some new work. Crash witch. <laughs> Sneaking the woods by last light to sift all you don't want. Hope you burnt the shreds of your haircut. In her kitchen, a little doll wrapped in a scrap of your suit. Her tattoo in hieroglyphs, she poked with a sewing needle. Should have been stitching a rose on a pillowcase. To think they thought they could make her sit up straight. Her dream hut spins in the thicket on chicken bone legs, a rusty two-tone truck, bigger inside than out. The better to house layers of drugstore sci-fi, old nests, bent oraries, all her trifles. Lucky stub, lucky stub, ashed on a plate, black fake nail scratching red-lined arms, crumbs on velvet. She says, what card am I holding? Why has no one offered her a suitcase full of money, some compensation for being alive? A cold desert, harsh and salty. How is it here? Head of a dog poking from the dish, ditch. It says, take me in, my eyes, infinity sad. She says, my familiar. Shouldn't Asmodeo sweep her up? pink cape flowing over the hills as soldiers hunt the burnt fields, one eye a blur, the other a green landscape. It's her mournful planet, something digging out from the ashes, trying to get born. Into her thicket gather all the birds. She's carried off, yelling, uh-oh, myth. <laughs> it's a chilly honor to be pinned among the stars. Her crowns are rake's end, a glittering fence adorned with tears of the poor. Her consolation is her uselessness. The question. Everyone keeps asking, am I the asshole? <laughs> but underneath, they're cocksure, all pleased with whatever awful thing they've done. Cruel stepmothers, vengeful sons, cheating fiancés. Am I the asshole? Yes. Yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> my solitude. I can just play solitaire on my phone all day. Who's going to save me from that? It's fine that everything is crazy. Still the riddle it always was. It's all alike, we keep on breathing. Keith said that. <clears throat> Today, stemming the tide of boredom with a wall of books. Tomorrow, I wonder, will you know me in my old person's suit? Scroll down, Mr. Chicken honks out, funky town. That's not a thing you forget. Some people remember their dreams. Is it time to leave the house? I need some things. One, spokesperson. Two, less haplessness. Three, never mind, I'm not going. <laughs> <laughs> bone on bone, one eye peeled. I traverse the hours like an ant.
crossing a bridge of ants. Mm. Restlessness. Hummingbirds thrown like toy planes. The strawberry plants throw out a few, few pink flowers, too little, too late. I have pulled clover and chickweed, snapped the brittle daylily stems. At evening, a bear crosses the backyard. The lives of animals must be like a dream. This happens, then this, then this, then time to go. Mm -hmm. Dreamlike. When I say like a dream, I mean you walk down a forest path, the forest pinches and narrows until you balance on the last fallen sapling. I can't explain the tendency to exist. Things arise, okay? Leaf litter, cartoonish mushrooms, low languid clouds slumping over hilltops. A series of words I juxtapose might not be a thought. Still, a thought might assemble itself. Music stumbles over a flood of vocabulary, skips branch to branch, seeking a point of entry. Idle days, world careening towards silence and cold. In the meantime, meantime I love, night's insects grow loud, exuberant. Let's go somewhere dark and look at the stars. It's sort of a complaint poem. Poem. Here we are, menaced by hailstone, lightning, avalanche, by that lake that turns in its bed to breathe out a smothering cloud. Rain-soaked hills, ready to fall like waves collapsing. Tremorous caldera preparing to blot out the sun. Trees that explode in the cold. And the animals, my God. No wonder we invented prayer, as if there must be someone, if we could just speak to the manager. How inconstant the ground, how thin the habitable air, you can climb right out of it. At least the stones, more indifferent than malicious, are here for us to stand on until the flood comes down. Day. The day is a casual reader misinterpreting the light. On the table, grasses of forgetfulness. The book, half under the bed, is wide awake and preaching to the cats. Picnic on the moon. Rabbit, woodcutter, princess, cups of pale tea, peeled eggs on blank porcelain half-finished sentences cut off by sleep. Immortal patrons of lunacy, sharp-shadowed, watching all night. Below, a dog with an air of menace leads me along the Black Canal. It's two more. As far as this world goes. Everything almost not here, a bubble burst to mist. Still, I get out of bed, go to work for decades, though it has come to my attention that I will die. I should have tunneled out. I had my spoon, but the days slipped by, just keeping the atoms organized, padded into the shape of a body until, undone by some bungle, the structure gives way, like a balsa wood bridge tested to failure reverting to prior condition as pile of sticks. At evening. It's not that I don't love the world, say when it's gilded in late light, like a movie about Edwardians having a picnic, green hills that swoon into harmless dark as war comes toward the white dresses. Or when shade creeps over the lawn and a cardinal begins his evening chant, a warning to all other cardinals repeated from his high lair till at some exact degree of dusk, he sleeps in the sway. Thank you.
That was wonderful, Martha. Thank you so much. Um, and next up is Gloria Monaghan, and she'll be reading from her collection, Cormorant on the Strand. Gloria is a professor, film producer, and poet. The title of her book refers to the New England bird often alone and on a rock, near but not too close to the shore. A library cormorant comes from a well-coined term from Coleridge, who maintained he gulped books down whole. <laughs> These poems begin in Michigan along the gray shores of Port Huron and migrate to the New England coastal waters, taking in their path the wreckage and ancestral ghosts who linger in the mind of the poet. As the 20th century creates the misfortunes of the 21st century, the poems focus on a time past forgotten perfumes, obituaries, poets, and dirt roads paved over. From the refuse, redemption is found in the films of the silver screen, which illuminate and create an alternative to reality. The films of Pastellini and Fellini focus on women and the strength women have despite their circumstances. Using publicity shots of Montgomery Clift and Elizabeth Taylor, the poet creates an imaginary place in heaven and on the movie set as well, ending with a place in the sun. Gloria Monaghan is a professor at Wentworth in Boston. She has published five previous collections of poetry and is widely published in literary and scholarly journals. Welcome, Gloria. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for coming out. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Um, I just really want to thank Eileen Cleary, who just gave that amazing introduction for Lily Poetry Review. A lot of people in here have been touched with her work and her editing prowess and her ability to get us all in the world. <laughs> and her co-editor, Christine Bess uh, Jones. And I also want to thank um, Michael McGinnis for the cover. He's here as well in the background. Um, you know, it, it's it's just incredible. You can't do anything alone. You got to do it with people. And I'm just so blessed. I could cry right now, actually. Thank you, James Frazier. Um, without which this would not, this is a lifelong dream of mine. And James made it happen. And Eileen made it happen. So can we give a hand? Can we give a hand? My my collection starts with nightmares, re reoccurring nightmares. Attic. I am in a familiar house. I call for justice, but the number is guilt. Cavaliers doors of past lives, the old familiar attic, the ancient wallpaper and sediment of rock exposed. And I am deeply afraid. Mariposa. Lost boy on the flyer. I didn't get your name. Riding on my bike in Provincetown. But I know whoever took you wanted something. Too young and unaware to protect yourself. But then a butterfly flew straight into my face. Young. And also an adolescent. Mm. This poem um, is after William, uh, Robert Duncan's uh, The Field, which many of you know. And I'm, I'm dedicating it to Michael Franco, who's out there in the Netherlands right now. He's, he's on Zoom, hopefully, that he knows. And this first quote is from Matthew. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And this from Leonardo da Vinci. Be open to mystery. Not everything is in straight lines. <clears throat> the feel. Stand with your feet apart. Sway your arms. Twist back and forth as if you were in a field. Your mouth, a yellow dandelion, sprouted. Tall grass past your ankles whispers through you. 
small white flowers of abundance shackle your heart. A green garden snake moves in the dirt like a question. Will you be sad tomorrow? Rolling down the hill, short straight hair freckles in the sunlight, dirt in the hands, summer shorts, no fighting in the field. Maybe I held your hand, sang a song. Skunk grass, poverty at lunch, dark shadows at four. Remember that show, Dark Shadows? <laughs> Only certain people know. She finally arrives to retrieve us into a place in the yellow mustang from the field of loss and the field of nothing where everything happened. <clears throat> so I was looking, I was doing research on my on obituaries. I'm not Irish. What you so, <laughs> um, 1916, James Flewelling shoots his friend by the explosion of a gun. Word was received that James Flewelling of St. Martin's died when his friend fired at a woodpecker with a breech loading gun while in search of a lost cow. <laughs> the futility of two men sitting on a log. Perhaps the light was fading. Fireflies were coming up and sh crickets were starting in the milkweed. Gnats rose from the rotting log. They were smoking. And good enough friends for the one to take the other's rifle and shoot at a small bird right above their heads. Was it frivolous or a joke? Was it impetuous cocksure bloodlust to fire at the red crown of a bird? His small striped body, white and black, his fine beak must have lured James into movement. Instead, it all backfired. The explosion smashing his childhood friend's skull, injuring his own twisted face. A wildly missing the immortal bird who flew away to another branch in the deep pine. Flewelling, very names of the bird who flies and never dies, but repeats his mistakes. A bell in sometimes spring, where hidden violets lie under moss and myrtle. Shameless rip off of Keats, but whatever. <laughs> <clears throat> So I'm staying with the summer and I'm staying with the butterflies. Swallowtail. The blue butterfly emerges along the path in the dunes, low to the ground near Queen Anne's Lace. Polycene, swallowtail, whatever name you call her, she is like the dust on your ankle in the heat of July. In early slipper moon, Venus, each one present in the other's view. Years ago, men wrote about the moon and called her Cynthia as if it were a woman so close to their heart, held in the early autumn, like forever beat of high summer when the clothes fall away from the body in some sort of sad departure. An early green tiny worm made its way into my home and I opened the door and set it free. <clears throat> and now we're on August. We're right around the corner from August. Let's face reality, which I hate. I hate. I love. I love the summer. August, month of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. A single brown leaf fell slowly from the tulip tree, and a bee sawed its way through the air like a dream of. Tomorrow, tomorrow, the young rose of Sharon bloomed white and ivy. The inner raspberry heart was like the lips of a boy lover who stole your heart when he was 19 and you were 22. Wide open, pale pink petals loom over the green and softly the heads bow open, the yellow stamen of despair. <clears throat> um, and again, you can see besides the butterflies, my focus is Provincetown, Redemption. This is a butterfly poem. A lonely mew. Well, it's not a butterfly poem, but you know, it doesn't. Redemption. A lonely mew of the gull on the rocks. 
head down, wings hover, brown rocks merge over dead low tide, small black pebbles, white broken shells abandon. I fell asleep on the sand. I heard you call me, the ocean in my ear, clear as day. It was a pure, wonderful feeling. You calling me through the wind, all the rubbish of the day swept away. I was not a thief, but a wild priest, looking through the hedges at illegitimate roses. The wind came up fast in early September. I could feel the winter waiting a dark thing in the mulberry bush, in the low grass near the vines. The Rose of Sharon dropped her noonday blossoms, now closed like promises taken back, oystered in the grass. Do not look at them. They'll shatter into nothing. The cat carried a sparrow in its mouth, turned the door. I thought about survival and whether love would come again. Mm. So you can see by the cover that Michael um, designed in the back, that Michael made in the back. It's Montgomery Cliff. Raise your hand if you know who this man is. <laughs> so it's usually like an over, an older crowd that knows who he is. Um, but he, he was a closeted gay um, man who was a brilliant actor and beautiful face and he was addicted to drugs and alcohol because he had to be closeted and so this is um a film i so i wrote a bunch of poems about the titles of his films i mean imagine being this amazing film star in the 1950s and being gay and having to so this is called remnants of my property which is a film very bad film actually with olivia de Havilland, but it doesn't matter <clears throat> Hey, old man. Hi. I didn't know then he was recording our conversations. Every day I called my brother until the last picture, Freud. I really should have won the Academy Award for that picture. My brother worked for the CIA, kind of record keeper. My lines in the heiress spell it out. I am not a mercenary. After the accident, I had to navigate things differently, use my face in ways I never realized I could, my hands, my walk, as if some wild thing caught a hold of me from the inside. I could not let anyone see what I knew about my body. I am not a mercenary. In suddenly last summer, I come to heal Catherine in the aftermath of St. Sebastian, poet, lover, destroyer, fraud. Instead, I become him. Some horrible things were said on that set. Catherine Hepburn spit in the director's face. She did that for me. Can you imagine? You are beneath contempt. I remember it well, being beneath contempt. I am not a mercenary. I have remnants of my property. <clears throat> And this is the last poem I read. And um, it's a really horrible movie called Rain Tree County. Um, but, it, you know, he can't choose. He's already gotten into a car accident. He was at Elizabeth Taylor's house, totally messed up on drugs and alcohol, crashed. <laughs> she, she pulled the teeth out of his throat. I mean, it was a horrible, horrible accident. So I think it's more like the concept of recovery here. <clears throat> Rain Tree County, it was Elizabeth Taylor and Montgomery Cliff, and I was studying the, the photographs, the still photographs of them and trying to get them to talk to me. Rain Tree County. So it's Elizabeth Taylor and Montgomery Cliff. She may have seen him for what he was, artist, saint, deplorable genius. He may have seen her for the same, beauty, drug-addled, violet-eyed. She sat there doing her hair. Simple white tighting, white tight fitting sweater, black pants. He black suit, white loosened collar, loose black tie, black spectacles at the edge of his nose, cautioning his Bessie. There's something I need to remind you about. 
Was she shushing him or were they just talking or gossiping? There was no advice that he could really give her other than be yourself. I will be myself. I will need to rewrite some of these lines. I will need something more to respond to than this. You know what I mean best. There are no staged photos of his open hands on his knees. I don't know what I have. For, do I have time for one more poem? Okay, this is the last one. <clears throat> and I don't know, I would love a show of hands for how many people saw A Place in the Sun. <laughs> cool. <laughs> The best picture of Monty and Elizabeth Taylor was on the set of A Place in the Sun. He is 30, she is 17, part of the black and white studio series. Their bodies engrave each other. His hand squeezes her bicep. She's laughing. He has a cigarette in his mouth, managing a dazzling smile. Broad tweeted jacket and an open white collar, born for the screen and high resolution photos. She looks directly at the camera. He away to some guy dragging equipment. Her body relaxed, pops above, beyond, his hand in his pocket. He calls her Bessie the cow at the premiere. Later, after the accident, she stays with him, puts her salary down for him to star next to her in reflection of, of, uh, reflections in a golden eye. In this photo, there is glamor. The adobe walls of the studio, the fake street or intended alley, a moment stopped in time, immortalized lines of his cheek, white teeth, and cigarette. He carries her upside down, over his shoulder, her broad backside an autumn bell. Maybe it was a green A-frame skirt, a saint in the street, Judas in the waiting room. There's always someone who understands you without words. A glance, a smile, a tear, who cradles your head in their hands, saves you from the wreckage. It is what some call a haven of mercy. The body is a home for the soul we return to, broken and bruised, cracked and lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. That was lovely. Um, and our closing reader of the evening is Richard Hoffman, who has published four previous books of poetry, Without Paradise, Gold Star Road, winner of the Barrow Street Press Poetry Prize, and the Sheila Martin Book Award from the New England Poetry Club, Emblem and Noon Until Night, which received the 2018 Massachusetts Book Award for Poetry. His other books include the celebrated memoirs, Half the House and Love and Fury, the story collection, Interference and Other Stories and the essay collection, Remembering the Alchemists and Other Essays. He's an emeritus writer in residence at Emerson College and nonfiction editor of Solstice, a magazine of diverse voices. I'd like to read a, an excerpt from the Boston Sunday Globe, which encapsulates some of the power of this collection he'll read from tonight. There's something burning in the center of Richard Hoffman's new collection of poetry, People Once Real. Fury, for one thing, for the children killed with guns, for the dark and crumbling chaos of this American moment, for injustices and violations both widespread and personal, grief for another, for what and who's been lost, I miss my brothers, for innocence, for a navigable sense of the future, when clarity remains at least as hard, <laughs> honesty much harder. The flames of grief are less white hot than furies and more the sparkling tangle of electrical wires snaking the, beneath the floor. If you're not a prisoner, you're a god walking the catwalk weighted with bees. And so how to conceive of a future in this grave state? Let's leave metaphor for another day. Here we sit facing one another, our knees touching, hands joined, frightened, learning what we need what each of us will do, will need to do. The book burns too with love, 
and hope, however weary, however tattered that it brings. That hope, that glimmering sense that maybe something more or better is possible, raises the question of what one can do. What is the word for a way, the stalling sheen and carapace of the Japanese beetles seem alike? And if I find it, will the dying stop? Welcome, wow. Richard Hopkins. Hi, everyone. Uh, I have never had an introduction like that. I'm kind of blown away. Uh, thank you so much, Eileen. Thank you for everything. Thank you for this book. Um, people have remarked already about uh, what a fine editor Eileen is. And I have to say, yeah. Uh, I've never sat with an editor, and I've published many books, but I've never sat with an editor who line by line asked the hard questions, the right questions, and pushed me to open the poem up again. Even poems that had already been published here and there, you know, and I thought they're they're done, uh, came alive again, and and new possibilities emerged from our conversation. And to me, especially in this art of poetry. That's what an editor should be doing. So thank you. And thank you, James, and thank you, Groyer. Uh, this is, I'm kind of coming full circle here because Eric might remember this. Eric Hyatt in the back, another Lily Poetry Review Books poet. Um, but I launched my first book here back in the last century. <laughs> and uh, so I feel like I'm coming full circle. Uh, so I, I, I write a, a lot of different kinds of poems. And um, as Eileen was alluding to, many are poems of outrage and dissent. And they're fueled by a kind of anger or um, uh, moral insult. And I'm not going to read those tonight. Uh, I thought. This is, I, I thought about the venue, you know, I mean, this is an intimate space. Um, and certainly there's a place for that loud dissent. Uh, but I don't think this is it. I think uh, I want it, So I want to sort of do an acoustic set. You know? <laughs> like, that's it. I, and, and uh, you know, so we're going to have people once real unplugged. <laughs> I hope not unhinged. Um, but usually I begin readings with a poem by another poet, something my teachers taught me to do. And this is a poem by the wonderful and somewhat neglected poet of the last generation, Liesl Mueller. Um, it's, a, it's a quiet poem called The Middle Distance. You have retreated behind your eyes to enter your other life, the real one, where you are in charge of the characters. Your childhood has been corrected and you are not going to die. And you keep moving toward a figure whose arms stretch out to you. It is always the same figure and the distance remains the same. <clears throat> So I'm going to <clears throat> read this poem, particularly in this place sacred to poets, uh, about being a writer. It's called Vaccine. What is the word for the way the starling's sheen and the carapace of the Japanese beetle seem alike. And if I find it, will the dying stop? Words don't come easily to me. I used to think they were afraid of me. They hid in my chest, in my belly. Will the right ones make the dying stop? 
What word is there for the way some words unsaid erase you, for our hope not to hurt again, for what to say to make the dying stop? This poem is called Last Hope. If you ever come, my dreamed of world, the one we almost had, I will be gone with all the others. After all this waiting on wooden benches outside in the hall, after the clicking of heels on polished tile, after the furious shuffling of papers and the endless arguments over money, Bring with you people refreshed by love, disposed to wonder, surprised at cruelty. Improbable world I once believed in, rising from words like steam from a bowl of soup. World like an egg in a nest of the best debris. If against all odds you take shape one day, bring people whose hearts are less hesitant, new people better people than we were. Mm -hmm. And this is called Day That Mourn. Blessed are they that remember. For them, the muscle of the heart is twisted as if it is turning away or trying to. And what it turns from is both particle and wave emitted from past disaster, but illuminating nothing. Theirs is more than remains. And blessed are they that mourn the animals, that weep for the burning trees, that roar at the roaring flames and worry few tears before were real as these, that turn the light out, let the night in and contend with sorrow, that imagine what once they are gone, they might wish they had done, and in that darkness begin. This poem begins with an epigraph uh, from Cesar Vallejo in a uh, translation by Andres Rojas. It's called Dusk, and the, and the uh, lines from Vallejo are, I will die in Paris in a rainstorm on a day I already remember. <laughs> Dusk. Whether or not there is a river, I will be by a river. My mother will send my father to fetch me. He will toot the horn twice, and I will wish for more time. As usual, I've caught nothing. And whether or not I have already given up, I will know I have to go. I will put my gear in the trunk, whoomp. He will lean across the front seat and swing open the door, and I will enter the musk of the car, the smoky sweat of my father, and note the regret on his face. Though I was not always glad to see him, I am glad to see him. Whether or not I want more time, the sky will continue darkening. Already there are stars and waist high at the wood's edge, fireflies. My father clutches and shifts then touches me on the shoulder, staring ahead, eyes on the road. <clears throat> Um, uh, while we're driving, uh, this is a poem called I Don't Recall Where We Were Going. Uh, I'm going to dedicate this to Kathy Guerrero. I still don't know where we're going. <laughs> Some place about Sarah Schiffer's. <laughs> I don't recall where we were going. When we set out, the downpour was so loud, I didn't hear you ask if we should pull over. 
I'm sorry. The child in the back seat followed a rivulet's path down the window as if instructive. And the wipers, struggling to keep up, said life is luck and love and love and luck and luck and love as I tried to stay on the road, the torrents pouring across it, great fans of water slapping us from gigantic trucks roaring past. I dared not turn and look at you. I never was so frightened or alive. <laughs> um, so uh, while we're talking about downpours and rain and water and bloods, and, uh, this is a poem called That Water. Uh, a clear brook, spring-fed, gurgled over rocks deep in a forest where my parents brought me one hot summer as a boy. Now both of them are dead, so I can't ask them where to find it. But I will never forget how that water tasted. If you take a metal spoon, freeze water in it, then thaw it again, and as soon as it is liquid, touch your tongue to it, you'd have an idea. Or fresh rainwater, maybe, from a pie tin. But rainwater is not as cold and could not wake you like that. So for a moment, you hear insects scrabbling on pebbles, mossy stones humming greenly to themselves, and the light applauding. That water will never let you go. This is, no, well, I, won't, I won't introduce it. It's called Impenitent Thief. You know about the penitent thief next to Christ on the cross and this day, this is the impenitent thief. <laughs> Once a young woman heard a baby's cry coming from the house of death. Bloodied and fierce, she entered, snatched the child and barely made it out of there, the two of them alive. Dear child, you are mine, she whispered rocking the sleeping infant in her arms. Later, older, hurt by words, the child would turn and plunge into her like someone on fire into a pool of water. You are my child and I am your mother. The woman would sing then, soothing the child. But she had never forgotten. No mother has ever forgotten from whom she'd stolen it. So in, in the middle section of this book, there are a number of poems that are elegies that are mainly uh, uh, the result of my having lost my younger brother uh, really in childhood. He didn't actually die until later, but our lives completely uh, diverged because of his Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And so we had been playmates uh, like twins until uh, we, we were seven or so. Um, so this is one of the poems and it's called Late Elegy. Too young to know better. My brother and I ate flowers, pink rose petals. Their veins, I think, convinced us we could. The thin capillaries in the flesh of roses heavy on our family's wicker trellis or hanging over the neighbor's rickety fence. We smuggled salt from the kitchen, sat in the grass, feasted, laughed. The part of me that might have remembered what we said was not yet alive. I only know we wanted so much to be good, we must have believed we weren't. One petal at a time, a little salt. My brother and I ate flowers. Um,
This is called a church. I heard music, so I went inside. Just below the altar, behind the rail with its open gate, a chamber orchestra played Vivaldi. I found a place alone, not too far back, behind the others scattered here and there. The music was sublime, and if not for the hanging lamps, the stained glass windows, the statues and carved figures, the decorated corbelled arches, I might have closed my eyes. But everything called my gaze upward, even as Vivaldi carried on enthusiastically about La Primavera. And there, above the sanctuary, high in the painted dome, between a symbol I knew and one I didn't, a branching crack. And for the whole remainder of spring, I wondered for the life of me how anyone could ever get up there to fix it. <laughs> and I, I'm going to end with a new poem. And this is really new. So that when there's a lot of poets in the room. So when I say, I just finished this poem, you know it's about halfway there. Okay? <laughs> uh, and it is, it is once again, in, uh, an elegy in, in memory of my brother, Bobby. It's called This Close. Little brother, I have forgotten our secret, but I remember your cupped hand and steamy breath in my ear. Often I feel you near, adjacent my five hungry senses, like the spaces between my fingers between the letters of my name, between the numbers of my years, in sounds too high for ears, too low for even the foot soles. Sometimes I believe I see you shadow of a helpless fish in the curl of a breaking wave, or hear you like thin chains clinking on wobbling masts in a foggy harbor. And recently the grieving animal I am cooked up your likeness in a dream. You recognizably you, but nothing like the way I remember you, your round face intent upon surviving. I never wonder who you might have become, never think of you as almost, rather as weightless counterweight, as abstract afterward, ungone, a visitor from nowhere. You are where all the waters go, where I take myself to soothe myself to find a way to understand your absence. How aging I grew into it, grew onto it like a trellis. Is it your death or mine or ours or everyone's? I am moving through the whole length of this life you left so early. Thanks, Richard, so much. And thanks. Let's have a round of applause for all of the. To everyone who came out tonight, and especially to the Grolier, who really needs and appreciates our support. So whatever we can do to help the Grolier at any time is always appreciated. Thank you so much. And anyone who wants to um, talk with the poets or perhaps purchase one of their books, they're here if you want a signed copy. Thank you. Or any of these other books you might read. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank Please help just move the chairs up against the wall. Yeah. Yeah. Thank 